All right, so let's talk about what was discussed in your guys' breakout rooms. Um, what is folklore? Why is it fundamental to the African oral tradition? What are your personal experiences with folklore? And then what was your experience engaging the text? And what questions you may have? So who would like to start us off? So who would like to share? What is folklore? How did you guys define folklore in your groups? Um, you could type Kyle, but I would rather you say it out loud so that, okay, if you're at work, then I, I get it. But yeah, put it in the, in the chat, Kyle, but put it to everybody so that way we can all see it. But for Kyle who's typing and he's at work, what about everybody else? What is folklore? How does it relate to the African oral tradition? So Kyle asserts that folklore is stories and beliefs that are passed down from generation to generation. It's fundamental since it keeps beliefs and traditions alive within the community um, when people are able to share these stories and customs with one another. I think that's a great understanding of why it's important. Um, I think it's also a good understanding of, of what folklore is so we can use that as a working definition, right? Um, stories and beliefs that are passed down from generation to generation. Typically these stories are passed down orally, okay? Um, who could provide me an experience that you've had personally with folklore, whether it's community folklore, um, whether it's family folklore, cultural folklore, who could give me an example of folklore? No one has an example of folklore, no one's experienced folklore in their life? I guess like, Hello, my name is Ramon. Mm -hmm. The closest folk folklore that like I experienced was my mom telling me a story from what my grandma told her. And supposedly, I, I found bullshit, but I, supposedly like they were at a party, I guess. There was, these, there was this girl who went to a party and there was this man who wanted to dance with her. And then she said, yeah, and they started dancing and I guess midway, the, the guy's eyes turned black and started growing a tail and <laughs> supposedly that was the devil. And that was like, you know, that's all that I remember she told me, basically dancing with the devil. Yeah. So I'm sure. and, and I think maybe too, right? Like it may have a little bit more connotations being told to a daughter, right? It may be serve as like a, a, a warning story to kind of be careful with who you engage on dance floors and things of that nature. But I, I would take that as, as a form of folklore. So thank you, Ramon. Um, does anyone have any specified questions about the reading or want to talk about their experience this, um, reading the text? Did they find it hard because of the language? Um, did they find it relatable because of the language? Um, or what questions did you have about the reading? Um, I don't have any questions about it. Um, I kind of wanted to share an experience too, but um, I also want to add on to like the reading. Um, when I was first reading it, I was honestly like, what am I reading? Like, I kind of just didn't really get what I was reading. But after like, answering the questions, I was like, oh, okay, well, this definitely like, um, after like reviewing what folklore meant, I was like, okay, then this makes sense now. Yeah. But um, yeah, I was kind of confused and the people in my group were also like, yeah, like we we're kind of confused too. But um, something that we did speak about, um, well, for Hispanics, like we have a lot of like, a lot of things that I can say. Um, one thing that I had said growing up, like a story that um, my family used to always like talk about was like La Llorona and stuff like that. But then we also have like a bunch of superstitions and I don't know, like I'm pretty sure that can like, uh, go into like folklore and stuff but we have like a lot of like hispanic superstitions like one what my family has is like oh like if you drop a utensil in the house that means someone's gonna come and that's like one thing that like my family like really believes in because it's funny that it actually does happen um yeah like there's a lot of things that like if something happens and that triggers like something else to happen like yeah we just have a lot of superstitions that like I would call like BS on for like most of them. Um, I was actually just having this conversation with my cousin not too long ago about the superstitions, how it's like, 
everybody like not everybody but like most hispanics like know about these things and about these superstitions and stories and we like connect we connect with them when we talk about them like within our generation because you know our parents and our grandparents they're so like no that's true that's true and we're like oh it's not like bullshit to me yeah yeah a little bit further removed from the origins of, that, of those stories yeah yeah i get that thank you jocelyn that's a really good point can i ask you though jocelyn um did you read the um readings out loud or did you read it to yourself i read them to myself so um i think anyone who read read this out loud probably had a little better time understanding this because the way that is written is kind of written in a way that you have to read it out loud to make the most sense of it because when you hear it it's you're gonna be like, oh, okay i get it because what she's writing is a, essentially in her conversations right and conversations are they're they're auditory you hear them so that, that's why i encourage you all to read it out loud when you engage the text i think it'll be a little bit more easier to digest. Um, looking at the chat, question was posed in the chapter we read is the way the author wrote the text considered folklore. Um, yes and no. And when I get into my notes, Ashlan, I, I think you'll get a better understanding of what the author was doing. So with that being said, let's just get into my notes um, and then we'll jump into our fishbowl. So I, I do ask that you get a pencil and paper um, so that way you can take notes because I'm going to be going over some things that are going to be helpful for your midterm. So be prepared for that. Um, this notion of folklore, right? So before we get into that, let's kind of take a, a step back and see where we came from in the semester to let us up to where we're at, right? So we started with who are the African people who we're studying in this concept of oral tradition. Um, we engage the notion of the metronefer, right? The idea of good speech, which I, which I would call as the apex of the African oral tradition. Um, we went into the ethical code that guided ancient Kemet, which was Ma'at. We engaged pre-colonial West Africa, and we also talked about how colonialism impacted, negatively impacted Africa through the work of Valdoma Patrice Somme. Um, from there, we engage the tension between colonial languages and native African languages through Ngugi. And last week, we explored a poetic on the trans transatlantic enslavement period through Lisson. So we touched on who these African people are. We've touched on what they've been through. Now we're talking about how they're producing these oral traditions, right? And, and this is, situates us within this notion of folklore. Um, so Kyle gave us a definition of folklore, which I say is a great working definition, um, as articulated by Webster, folklore is the traditional beliefs, customs, and stories of a community passed through, passed through the generations by word of mouth. So again, the oral component of the folklore becomes important. Zora L. Hurston herself, who is the author of this text, states folklore Folklore is the art of the people before they find out that there is any such thing as art, right? So Zora Hurston is articulating folklore as a form of art, and I, and I would agree with her. So this is what I want you guys to take note of. We are dealing with these things called um, theoretical frameworks. I gave you your first theoretical framework at the start of the semester through my articulation of African-American male theory, right? And we know that African-American male theory states that African people are resistant and resilient with innate capacity for brilliance. So that's our first um, theoretical framework. The next theoretical framework is entitled Funds of Knowledge. And I'll put this in the chat for you. And Funds of Knowledge is not only just a, a theory, right? But it also serves as a critique. Um, the individual who came up with this concept, her name is Tara Yoso. She's a sociologist and an educator. Tara Yoso developed this notion of funds of knowledge as a critique of a notion that became um, famous through the work of Pierre Bordeaux, who was a French philosopher. And his claim is called cultural cultural capital, excuse me. So Bordeaux comes up with cultural capital 
to answer the question, why is it that certain communities, certain segments of communities are able to achieve, achieve academic success and some are not, right? So Bordeaux says certain, certain communities can achieve academic success because they have cultural capital. They're able to attend museums. They're able to attend art exhibits, right? Um, cultural capital may look like if I have a son who plays soccer, he may be on the same team as his teacher's son, right? So they're bringing soccer together, which allows me to hang out with the teacher on the sideline during games and develop some type of rapport with the teacher, right? So now the teacher's going to look at my son a little bit differently because not only is he A, friends with his son, but B, me and that teacher have some type of rapport. This is this idea of cultural capital asserted by Pierre Bordeaux, the French philosopher. Tara Yoso says, ah, hold on, Bordeaux. I disagree with this idea. Well, not even that. I feel that this notion of cultural capital is elitist, right? You have to have money to attend the museum. You have to have money to attend the art, art exhibit, right? You have to live in a certain community that will allow your teacher to play, your teacher's son, kids to play sports with your kids, right? So money comes involved. While that's going on, Yoso asserts, there's also this thing that's called funds of knowledge, right? And these are how funds of knowledge is how certain communities pass down knowledge from generation to generation, a knowledge that is oftentimes not recognized by the dominant society, right? So this may be look, may look like um, abuela's tortilla recipe. It may look like grandmother's gumbo recipe, right? For me, um, my grandmother would tell my mother and my mother would tell me to be black in this country, you had to be twice as good. You had to be twice as skilled, work twice as hard just to get the opportunities, right? So that's the funds of knowledge that gets passed down generationally that often don't get recognized by dominant society. So this is what I want you to write down. A working definition of funds of knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge passed down from generation to generation that speaks to a culture's uniqueness and allows that culture to make sense of their place in the world. So again, knowledge that gets passed down from generation to generation that speaks to a culture's uniqueness and allows that culture to make sense of their place in the world. And oftentimes this knowledge is not recognized or validated. So that's funds of knowledge, okay? So we know our first theoretical framework is African-American male theory. Our second theoretical framework is funds of knowledge. Now, on your midterm, when you have to answer the three of the five questions, I'm going to expect you to work through these theoretical frameworks. So, for example, if I pose the question on the midterm, how old are African people and why is this information significant? Answering the question using a theoretical framework may sound like this. Um, using African-American male theory, to add, um, using African-American male theory, which states African people are resistant and resilient with innate capacity for brilliance, African people can be traced back 8 million years old. This becomes important because it situates them in their proper place in the world, right? So I'm using the framework to help create an understanding and a scaffolding for answering my question. Don't get too stressed out about that now. As we get closer to the midterm, We'll go over these a little bit more and we'll kind of use them in practice to allow you to make more sense of what these theoretical frameworks are. But I just want to kind of familiarize you with them, okay? So let's get into the book. The text is titled Mules of Men. The author, one second. So the author is Zora Neale Hurston. Here's an image over here. So Zora Neale Hurston is not only an author, she's a filmmaker, and most importantly, she's an anthropologist, right? Um, she was born in January 7th, 1891. Um, her probably more, most famous text is Their Eyes Are Watching God. Um, and she's a central figure in the Harlem Renaissance. Now, I emphasize her role as an anthropologist. Um, let me ask, is anybody familiar with the discipline of anthropology or can provide us with a definition of what anthropology does and what they research? 
Nobody familiar? Nobody took an anthropology course? Okay. So anthropology is the study of peoples. It's the study of groups of peoples and, and ethnicities, right? And anthropology became famous in the um, 19th century. So when you hear 19th century, you should think in your mind like the 1800s, right? So if, 19, if the 19th century produces this discipline called the anthropology, um, and we know that anthropology is the study of groups of people, let me ask you this. Well, I'm gonna make a claim and then I'll ask you a question. So I assert that, fun, that fundamentally, anthropology is a racist discipline. Anthropology is a fundamentally racist discipline. Why would you think I would say that anthropology is a fundamentally racist discipline? Let me ask you this question then. We're talking about the, the 19th century, we're talking about the 1800s. Who do you suppose is doing this anthropological work? Who is doing the anthropology at this time? Ashley, say that out loud for me, please. White people. What type of white people? White women or white men? Um, white men. White men, okay. So we have white men going into these communities in Africa, in Asia, in Central and Latin America, and doing this research, not speaking the language, not understanding the traditions, not understanding the customs, and producing knowledge based on their observations, right? By and large, what this knowledge produced was the inferiority of the groups that they were studying, right? So at the same time anthropology is coming on the scene, the eugenics movement is picking up steam. Is anybody familiar with the eugenics movement or what eugenics is? It's fake science made within the heat of the, um, well, within this peak of the, I guess, immigration movement that happened within like the early 20th century. Um, basically a bunch of uh people especially from europe um africa at the time as well um were essentially all moving to the united states and a lot of the white population didn't like that because a study showed that within uh the next hundred years or so um the amount of the, the amount of mixed population and ethnic population that would exist in america would overtake the white population right. thus they came up with eugenics as a means to um essentially um create fake science to um sterilize that um specific group of immigrants and then eventually um pass laws to make it either a mandatory or b um, in some cases even just shutting them off altogether so um it, it made i guess immigration harder basically all they said was you know um because you're from these countries and you're not exactly white your kids are going to be suffering through um, so many different types of diseases. So you might as well just get sterilized and not have kids versus, um, you know, uh, letting that come into the world. Yes. So what Jaden Jaden just articulated is what eugenics evolved into. But when it started, it was about classifying the races based on their intellectual capacity. So they would use food, um, pseudoscience as Jaden is mentioning to say okay based on the size of someone's cranium will determine their their intelligence right so because of the size of the white people's head they're the smartest followed by Asians followed by indigenous people followed by Africans right and this classification was largely supported by the work of anthropology right and so what happens is they use this science to develop things like IQ tests to support the stereotypes that they're creating they use the science to create standardized testing like your ACTs, your SATs, to support the stereotypes that they're coming up with based on the intellectual inferiority of these other groups, right? So this is this idea of eugenics that's being supported by the work of anthropology. And these are why I say that eugenics is, I'm sorry, that anthropology is a fundamentally racist discipline, okay? So while all this is going on, Zornel Hurston comes to the scene. She's actually trained by who is widely recognized as the father of anthropology, Franz Boas. And what 
Zonell Hurston does, in my estimation, is she gives anthropology the middle finger. Okay? Because again, by and large, what anthropology does, it goes out and researches the other. Zona Hurston said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go back and research my own, right? So she's born in Alabama. Her family moves to Florida, okay? She goes to college, gets her degrees, and wants to come back to Florida to do this research. And what this book is, is an ethnographical collection of folklore and stories um, that were collected during her time in 1923, I believe it is. Um, yeah, not sorry, 1927 through 1928 when she spent time in Polk County, Florida, Edenville, Florida, and New Orleans, right, to get these stories. Now, the vast difference between what Zornel Hurston is doing and what other anthropologists are doing, Zornel Hurston is going back to the community from which she came, right? So she knows the language. She knows the customs. She knows the culture. She knows the, the um, nuances of, this, of these people who she's researching. Anthropologists, by and large, they don't know those type of nuances. They don't know the language. They don't know the culture. Oftentimes, when anthropologists engage these communities, these communities would be suspicious of the anthropologists, right? So they wouldn't give them all of the details of their culture because they did not trust them. But Zornel Hurston comes from this community, so that suspicion is not there. They trust her, right? So what she does is, her, she wants to go down and put these folklore, put these stories, put these parables on wax to make this oral tradition a written tradition, right? And this is what this book is, is designed to do. Also within the text is this idea of subversion. Who could provide me with a working definition of this notion of subversion? What is subversion? What does it mean to subvert authority? Subversion of authority. What does that mean? What does it mean to be subversive? Nobody? Can mean to like, can it mean, I'm just thinking it guys, but can it mean to like retaliate or take a different stab against it? Kind of. You, you're, 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 you're trending along the right way, Jesse. Um, I'll put it to you guys this way, right? We're, all, we're, all, we're driving a car, me and Jesse, right? Jesse's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. I got a warrant on me, right? One time pulls behind us, whoop, whoop, flash some lights on us. Again, I have a warrant on me, right? So they get Jesse's license and registration. They go through that little rigmarole. Then they come on the other side and ask me for my information. Now, if I tell them my real name, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to jail, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them my brother's name and my brother's information because he ain't got no warrant. So what I, use, what I did is I used my intelligence to outsmart the powers that be, i.e. the police, to keep my ass out of jail, right? So subversion, to be subversive is to use intelligence to secure yourself, to keep yourself safe, to, to allow yourself to survive, right? This idea of subversion is fundamental in the Black literary tradition, in the Black radical tradition, just in Black life ways, especially for Africans who were forced to go through the experience of enslavement, right? One of the most famous stories of subversion, true story, is this African individual, I forget his name, but he gets this big ass box, right? A box big enough that he could fit in it. He gets a shipping address, uh, and I believe he puts the shipping address to Canada, climbs in the box and ships himself to freedom, right? So again, using your intelligence to outthink, outwit, and outsmart your oppressor to give yourself safety, okay? This is this notion of subversion. The story of John the bear and the lion is a story of subversion, right? Because what happens? The bear gets shanked. The, he knows that the blood that he left is gonna attract the lion. And he knows at this point, I don't want no smoke with this lion. I'm already injured, I can't fight him. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna outsmart the lion and put the lion on, the, on John's ass, right? So that way he's not on me, he's he about to go deal with John. So again, you're using your intelligence to outsmart those who are in power over you or who are in authority over you to maintain your ability to survive, right? This is this notion of survival, of subversion, excuse me. 
So not only is she writing about subversion through the stories that are being told, the book itself is an act of subversion to the discipline of anthropology, right? Because while the powers that be in anthropology are producing these stereotypical um, books that ensure the inferiority of other cultures, she's going to produce a book that's going to ensure the cultural authenticity of the culture that she came from, right? Again, taking the oral tradition and placing it into a written tradition by articulating and writing these things down, okay? So this is the work that Hurston is doing within her text. So she's literally going down to Florida, hanging out with the people from Florida, listening to, listening to them tell their stories, and she's writing these stories down and writing the accounts of everything that takes place while she's visiting these areas, right? So this is the work that she's doing. So to go back to Ashlan's question, right, is this, is the way that she wrote this folklore, I want to say yes, because what she's doing is she's recording them tell the folklore, right? But the way she's writing it is really profound because she's not dressing up the language. She wrote it just how she heard it, right? She wrote, she didn't put the ER on the words. She didn't put the ING on the words. She wrote it down just like she heard it. So that's why I want to say yes to Ashlan's question. But the language itself is not the folklore. The stories are the folklore. Ashlan, does that does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. So those are my notes. Um, what I would like to do from here is just transition into our um, fishbowl quickly. We don't have a lot of time left. Um, again, you could talk about my notes. You could talk about the breakout rooms, or you could talk about your journal. Is there any volunteers to fishbowl? May I? Uh, I'm sorry, who said that? Uh, Kaylin. Kaylin, absolutely. Let me write that down. Um, so we have Kaylin. Who else? Um, I could do it. Okay, Kaylin and Maribel. Um, One more. Any other volunteers or should I call that random? All right, I'll call that random. Um, Eric, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, no, I'm gonna use my skip. Okay, so you got your skip. Um, I know Kyle, you said you're at work. Adam, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, no, can I also use my skip? Um, Jesse, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, I've already gone twice. I'm not sure if you still want me to go. No, you, if you're if you're twice, you're good, man. You don't have to worry about it. Thank you for reminding me. Um, no problem. Aldo, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Aldo, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Okay. Um, Maria, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah, I could go. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we have Kaylin, Maribel, and Maria for our fishbowl. Whoever wants to start us off, it's on you. Uh, okay, I'll go. I really liked um, reading it in the way where she doesn't sugarcoat like the language and doesn't make it. Um, like you can tell that she kind of wrote it how she orally heard it. And that's, I feel like that just makes it more personal and real. And I liked that part of the reading. Thank you, Mar Maria. Who's next? Um, so I have trouble uh, understanding the reading, I think, because like uh, you mentioned, um, it would be better to read it out loud. Um, and I, I didn't have the chance to read it again, but now I'm looking forward to uh, actually reading and understanding it. Um, but like we were talking about um, folklore and it reminded me of um, like the stories that my uh, family also uh, shares, uh, like the Day of the Dead, um, the belief that uh, setting up an altar and setting up their favorite food, um, it means that our ancestors will come and visit us and eat with us for that, especially specifically that day. Um, 
yeah that's it okay yeah my experience when reading the text is I was also confused I don't know if it's because I was like overthinking it a lot because like in the beginning it mentions like the bear and then the lion and John and who the king of the world was mm -hmm. and then I was like okay it's probably gonna be like a lesson like the tortoise and the hare it was gonna be like some type of story like that and then it transitions into like the some man teaching them how to like eat fish and then like towards the end it talks about like a rib and how like women are meant to be besides men or something like that and so I was just so confused but then after the questions you gave us about the folklore I was like oh okay it's like traditions not traditions but like stories being passed down by a generation and so then I kind of got like a better understanding after like the breakout rooms and like the questions you gave us Uh, I'm sorry, Kaylin, did you go already? Uh, yeah. Can I add, though? Yeah, yeah, please. Because I was reading, and I understand, like, I think reading it, it I kind of tripped up, uh, tripped up on stuff when I was reading it, because I read it out loud, because you said it would be easier to understand if I read it out loud, and I did, and yeah, it definitely made it easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, like, researched, like, background on it, and it made me understand it better, because I realized there was only one chapter that we were reading. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah um yeah that, that's a really good point Kaylin. like so keep in mind right like i pulled one chapter out of a whole book so you don't have the context of the introduction the foreword and things of that nature and that's why like when i go through my notes i try to provide you that context to help it hopefully make it a little make a little bit more sense but again think about the setting because um i believe it was maria who was saying like the shifts in the story confused me right so at first um we got the story about the bear and shit, and then it goes into how to eat some fish, like, okay, we're, we're random, and then now it's something about a rib. But think about how I articulated what she's doing, okay? So literally, imagine yourself chilling at a lake in Florida somewhere, everybody's sitting around fishing, what we call um, telling stories and talking shit, right? Talking about um, how, talking about this this idea of, of the bear, the lion, and John. So people are telling the story while fishing, okay? Um, I think it was Maria who says um, the tortoise and the hare, right? That's another story of subversion if you think about that story. So you were on the right path with that. So they're talking about that. They caught some fish. Now the conversation changes to the proper way to eat the fish, right? And then notice the elder in the group is telling everyone how to eat the fish. Think back to Patahotep, right? I'm gonna use my old age. So that's the story that's going on at that moment. And then it starts to rain, right? Or they, they smell the rain in the air. It's like, you know what, let's, let's transition to the juke. So they're starting to get ready for the juke joint, for the party, right? And as they're getting ready for the party, evening sets in. And then she starts to write and articulate what's going on for the evening, okay? And then as everyone is setting up for the evening, a preacher comes on the scene, a traveling preacher with his two companions, the women who were singing, right? And he gives a sermon about the creation of man and how Adam and Eve, when God made Adam, he knew Adam was lonely, and he needed a companion, so he pulled from Adam's rib and made the woman, Eve, so he would not be lonely, right? So all Jornel Hurston is doing is accounting for what's happening in front of her. So yes, it seems random as fuck, right? But think about just hanging out on a, on a hanging out on the block on a on a any any random day, right? How does your conversations change from one thing to another, right? You could very well end up talking about a story you heard about a lion, then talking about the right way to eat chicken, the right way to eat a burrito, whatever the case may be, and then somebody just appears on the scene giving a, a sermon, right? So yes, it seems random from a, if you're looking at it as a story to have like a beginning, a, a start, a middle, and an end, it's not going to give you that. But if you place yourself as someone who's sitting on a lake, watching, observing people fish and talk, then it's going to make a little bit more sense right? She's essentially people watching and then recording what she's witnessing. Does that make it make a little bit more sense for y'all? Okay. Yes. Okay. 
So this is what we'll do. We'll call it a day there. Um, let me show you what the reading is for next week. So in my estimation, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the subject matter which she was talking about wasn't too difficult to digest. I think what makes this story hard is the way that it was written. Um, how her, um, how, how Maria said she just, she didn't sugarcoat the language. She wrote it how she heard it, right? Next week is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be written in a way that's very easy to digest. It's beautifully written. It's a magnificently written text. But the subject matter, what the author is talking about, is a little bit harder to, to wrap your mind around. Um, trigger warning is, is some things that are very uncomfortable. But, you know, we'll get through it. Um, so for next week, we're reading James Baldwin. So we'll spend two, two weeks with Baldwin. And we'll be reading these three PDFs. So it's all one story, going to meet the man. But please read all three PDFs and make one journal entry for the three PDFs. Because you need to read all three to get the whole story. So again, it's beautifully written, but the subject matter is, is hard to deal with. Very much trigger warning. You're going to feel uncomfortable. But you'll, you'll be all right. We'll discuss it and, and make our way through it together when we meet next week. Um, 